Today's topic for lecture is method of clinical examination of swelling, ulcer, TMJ and lymph node. So starting with the table of contents, we are going to study about the examination of swelling which includes the history, the physical examination and the local examination of the swelling. Then we are going to continue with the examination of ulcer which also includes the same that is the history, physical examination and the local examination. Then the last part of the lecture we are going to study about the examination of TMJ and lymph nodes. So what are the learning objectives of this lecture? At the end of this lecture the student will be able to learn about the clinical examination of the swelling, ulcer, TMJ and lymph nodes. He will know the type of ulcers and uh, associated diseases. He will also know about the types, uh, different types of lymph nodes in the head and neck region. Starting with the examination of swelling, what uh, is a swelling? When we dis de define a swelling, it is a vague term which denotes any enlargement or protuberance in the body due to any cause. Whereas a lump is a vague mass of body tissue, a tumor or neoplasm is a growth of new cells which proliferate independent of the need of body. So benign tumor, they proliferate slowly with little evidence of mitosis and invasiveness to the surrounding tissues, whereas a malignant tumor, it proliferates with a faster rate and with invasiveness and mitosis. So here are the pictures of swelling. Here you can see uh, congenital swelling, a traumatic swelling, inflammatory swelling, and the fourth one is a neoplastic swelling. So depending upon the cause, the swelling is further classified. Starting with the examination of swelling, in the first part we are going to see about the history of present illness. So uh, duration, the patient is asked leading question as in how long is the lump present there, when was the lump first noticed. So uh, depending on the duration, if it, the swelling is of shorter duration with pain, it is an inflammatory swelling. Whereas a swelling which is of longer duration but it is not painful, it is a neoplastic swelling. So mode of onset. Uh, how did the swelling start? Did it uh, develop spontaneously uh, or did it start with pain or did it grow rapidly? So these are the leading questions we need to ask to the patient. Next uh, we ask other symptoms associated with the swelling that is pain, uh, difficulty in swallowing, respiration, interfering with any movement, uh, disfiguring. So pain, why is there pain associated with the swelling? Because uh, there is impingement of nerves, involvement of nerves or ulceration, inflammation. So we need to ask the type of pain, throbbing, um, stabbing pain associated with the swelling. Um, so these are the leading questions we need to ask to the patient. Next come to the progress of the swelling. Uh, did the lump change its size since it was first noticed or there was a change in the surface or consistency of the swelling? So benign, uh, sw usually benign and malignant, how do you differentiate the tumors? In benign, it grows so slowly and it remains static for a long period. Whereas a malignant tumor, it grows quickly and the swelling suddenly increases after remaining static for a long period. So in this way, we can differentiate between the two swellings, that is the benign and malignant tumors. The exact site of the swelling, which is obvious on inspection, uh, in case of huge swelling, the origin cannot be determined. Next we come to fever, whether the swelling is associated with fever. So in that case it is an inflammatory swelling. Uh, other cases, uh, presence of any other lump uh, such as seen in neurofibromatosis or Hodgkin's lymphoma. So whether patient ever had any other lump, we need to ask this question. Next we come to impairment of function, whether there was any loss of movement and intensity and how much of it is due to the swelling. Uh, and next, the last part, we come to recurrence of the swelling. Uh, malignant or cystic swelling, it uh, it recurs when the cyst wall is not fully or removed, it is not removed completely. So there is recurrence of these swellings. Coming to the past history, presence of similar swelling or recurrence of swelling is asked. Such uh, In cases such as syphilis and tuberculosis, there is recurrence of swelling. Personal history, any tissue abusive ha habit such as beetle leaf, lime, tobacco, these habits are asked to the patient. Coming to the physical examination, the patient should be looked as a whole. Uh, cachexia or malnutrition may be present at the first look. The attitude of the patient should also be observed. 
द वीकनेस ऑफ द बॉडी मे बी ड्यू टू सीवियर इलनेस एबनॉर्मल एटीट्यूड मे बी सीन इन मैलिग्नेंट कंडीशन ड्यू टू इम्पेंजमेंट ऑफ नर्व्स सो दिस दिस नीड्स टू बी ऑब्जर्व इन द पेशेंट द पेशेंट नीड्स टू बी ऑब्जर्व फिजिकली इफ देर इज एनी वीकनेस सो वी नीड टू सी दीज कंडीशन नेक्स्ट वी कम टू द लोकल एग्जामिनेशन विच इंक्लूड्स इंस्पेक्शन स्टार्टिंग विद इंस्पेक्शन इन इंस्पेक्शन द साइट ऑफ द स्वेलिंग इज सीन द एक्सटेंट ऑफ द स्वेलिंग इन हॉरिजोंटल एंड वर्टिकल डायरेक्शन कलर समटाइम्स इट गिव्स द डेफिनेटिव डायग्नोसिस सपोज इट इज़ अ ब्लूइश कलर स्वेलिंग दैन वी कैन कम टू अ डायग्नोसिस ऑफ अ रैन्यूला रेडिश स्वेलिंग सीन इन केस ऑफ हिमैनजोमा ब्लैक स्वेलिंग इन केस ऑफ मेलानोमा एंड बेनाइन नीवस so here is a bluish colored swelling at the floor of mouth so we can describe it as a, as a ranula next we come to the shape of the swelling ovoid pear shaped kidney shaped spherical or irregular these are all the shapes of the swelling the size of the swelling the horizontal and vertical dimension should be clearly mentioned in case uh, case history sheet so here we can see a protrubi- protruding swelling it is it has a stalk so it is pedunculated next we come to the surface of the swelling on inspection it is difficult but some swellings have obvious and diagnostic surface example is cauliflower like shape in squamous cell carcinoma corrugated appearance in cases of papilloma a smooth surface in case of irritational fibroma or lipoma and a ulcerated surface seen in cases of malignancy so depending on the surface of the swelling it can be further classified next we come to pulsation transmitted pulsation pulsation arising from swelling which lies just superficial to the artery in close relation with it whereas expansile pulsation pulsation originate from the arterial walls so we need to see whether the there is pulsation or not in the swelling next we come to the skin over the swelling if it is a red or edematous skin then it is a inflammatory swelling whereas tense and glossy skin it is sarcoma with rapid growth black punctum on the skin sebaceous cyst scar previous operation injury or uh, previous operation coming to the movement on uh, deglutition flu swellings are fixed to the larynx or trachea causing movement on deglutition so uh, we know that the hydroglossal cyst it moves up along with the protrusion of tongue so we need to see whether the swelling moves on the protrusion of tongue uh, so we can come to a definitive diagnosis next we come to palpation uh, the temperature of the swelling is increased in cases of inflammatory swellings tenderness uh, pain experienced when pressure is exerted uh, by the clinician the size shape and extent which we were seeing in inspection we have again uh, need to clarify it in palpation deeper dimension of swelling can be palpated and noted whether the mass is poorly defined moderately defined or well defined should be ascertained coming to the surface smooth surface swellings are uh, seen in cases of cyst lobular with smooth bumps are seen in uh, case of lipoma nodular swelling matted lymph nodes irregular and rough is seen in cases of carcinoma coming to the edges and borders of the swelling there is a test which is known as slip sign when the edge of the swelling is palpated the margin of the solid swelling does not yield to the palpating finger but slips away from it but in case of a cystic swelling the edge yields to the pressure of the palpating finger and it does not slip away so this sign is used to differentiate between the uh, solid and a cystic swelling Uh, coming to the benign swellings they have smooth margins whereas malignancies they have ill defined borders acute inflammatory swellings they have ill defined or indistinct margins the consistency of the swelling uniform consistency soft easily compressible tissue as in cases of lipoma mucosal cyst uh, cheesy uh, finer tissue that has granular sensation but no rebound rubbery tissue that is firm but can be compressed slightly and rebound to the normal contour as soon as the pressure is withdrawn firm swellings that tissue that cannot be readily compressed so depending on the consistency we can further classify the swelling bony hard uh, the modifying factors thick layer of overlying tissue especially the muscle or fibrous tissue soft glandular tissue surrounded by dense connective tissue capsule will be perceived more firm depth in the tissue will alter the consistency so variable consistency so the consistency can be uniform or variable or bony hard 
next we come to fluctuation when we say a swelling is fluctuant we have to do a two finger test so uh, the finger of the hand will remain passive and um, the other finger it will perceive the move involvement of fluid displaced by the first finger first finger so this is the two finger test uh, depending on this test we can say whether the swelling is fluctuant or not next we come to fluid thrill percussion wave conducted to its other pole when one pole is tapped when one uh, pole of the swelling is tapped the wave of the percussion can be felt on the other hand so then we can say that uh, there is a percussion wave coming to translucency swelling can transmit light though when it uh, through when it contains fluid like water serum lymph or plasma reducibility swelling can be reduced and ultimately disappear as soon as it is pressed upon coming to the pulsatility we need to see whether the swelling is pulsatile or not the fixity to the overlying skin skin is made to move over the swelling benign lesions are freely movable possible uh, encapsulated mass originating in loose subcutaneous tissue or submucosal tissue sebaceous cyst is freely movable to the underlying tissue but it is bound to the skin so we need to see further the fixity to the overlying skin so fixed swelling is a malignant swelling a uh, mass in a neck fluent mass in a neck moves up and down as patient swallows then it must be attached to the hyoid bone larynx trachea thyroid or parathyroid gland if elevated on the protrusion of tongue then it is definitely a thyroglossal cyst coming to the relation to the surrounding structures tumor arising from the subcutaneous tissue is free from the overlying skin and from the underlying contracted muscles tumors which arise from the muscle the swelling can be moved when the muscle is relaxed so swelling around a bone it is fixed whereas a swelling around a muscle it is movable so we can differentiate by uh, seeing the relation of the swelling uh, to the under surrounding structures coming to the aspiration straw colored fluid contains cholesterol crystals in wall that are frequently seen so we can come to a diagnosis that it is a odontogenic and fissural cyst thick yellowish white and granular fluid a lamina is filled with keratin so epidermoid and keratocyst we have a thick yellowish white fluid yellowish cheesy material seen in dermoid cyst sebum thick homogeneous and yellowish cheesy material seen in sebaceous cyst coming to the amber colored fluid dark amber colored fluid is seen in the thyroglossal duct cyst the lymph fluid uh, which is colorless with high lipid content appears cloudy and frothy seen in hygroma and lymphoma blue blood uh, is seen in hematoma and hemangioma red colored uh, blood is seen in aneurysm and arteriovenous fistula pus is seen in aspiration of painful warm fluctuant swelling and it which yields pus sulfur granules are seen in a condition called as actinomycosis pus along with yellowish granule is yielded which is nothing but sulfur sulfur granules clear viscous fluid may be seen in retention phenomenon this finishes the first part of the lecture that is the examination of swelling now we come to examination of an ulcer so what is a ulcer and what are the examination of ulcer the ulcer is a well circumscribed or uh, sometimes depressed lesion with an epithelial defect that is covered by a fibrin clot resulting in a yellowish white appearance a break in continuity of the covering epithelium that is skin or mucous membrane is called as an ulcer so starting with the examination of ulcer what do we note uh, in when we examine an ulcer uh, coming to the history of present illness we ask the patient how long is the ulcer present incubation period should be noted whether uh, uh the amount of time since the ulcer is present the mode of onset how has the ulcer developed is the ulcer painful ulcer associated with inflammation are generally painful does the ulcer discharge or not if yes inquiry must be made about its nature what kind of discharge is there is it serum is it pus or is it blood the associated diseases like generalized tuberculosis nephritis or diabetes may lead to ulcer formation so you need to take a proper medical history of the patient and you need to ask the associated diseases so that may be the cause of the ulcer syphilis at the primary stage give rise to chancre and in tertiary stage it gives rise to gummatous ulcer
coming to the physical examination of an ulcer the general examination of the patient must be done as we do it in, in the case of swelling also we did the physical examination of the swelling so ulcer may be a sequelae of malnutrition general uh, atherosclerosis syphilis or tuberculosis so we need to see whether the patient is weak or uh, he has some other systemic disease or not coming to the local examination the size of the ulcer is important in deciding the time to which uh, which is required for the healing tuberculosis ulcer is oval in shape it, but may give, give a irregular crescent border the syphilitic ulcer is circular or semicircular to start but it may unite to form a serpiginous ulcer a carcinomatous ulcer is irregular in shape and size the number of ulcers is also noted tuberculosis gummatus varicose and soft chancre may be more than one in number so depending on the size the shape the number we need to classify these ulcers the position which gives uh, the clue to the diagnosis the rodent ulcers are ulcers present on the upper part of the face above the line joining the angle of mouth to the lobule of ear occurring frequently near the inner canthus of the eye malignant ulcers are more common on the tongue and lips the floor of the ulcer is the exposed surface of the ulcer red granulation tissue the ulcer is healing and healthy whereas pale and smooth granulation tissue also gives a diagnosis of a healing ulcer wash leather slough gummatus ulcer and black mass malignant melanoma discharge char uh, character of discharge sh should be noted now this is the most important uh, aspect of the ulcer which is called as the edge of the ulcer undermined edge as you can see in the figure a uh, denotes tuberculosis punched out edges denotes gummatus ulcer or deep trophic ulcer sloping edge as seen in c denotes healing traumatic or venous ulcer d is a raised edge and pearly white beaded edge so it denotes a rodent ulcer F fifth one is the rolled out or everted edge seen in cases of squamous cell carcinoma so we need to know the edge of the ulcer so we can classify the ulcer and we can know the systemic disease associated with it coming to the surrounding area glossy red and edematous ulcer is acutely inflamed scar or wrinkling in the surrounding skin uh, so there is a old case of tuberculosis we see a scar or wrinkling in the skin palpation uh, tenderness is noted uh, if the ulcer is tender it is inflamed slightly tender are chronic ulcers and neoplastic ulcers are never tender because there is no pain associated with them the edge and margins are ag again noted in palpation all the findings of inspection are confirmed on palpation indurated margins suggest a carcinoma the base of the ulcer as you can see in the figure this is the base of the ulcer uh, this is the base this is the floor of the ulcer and this is the edge of the ulcer base is on which the ulcer rests if it is a induration of the base it is seen in cases of squamous cell carcinoma coming to the depth it makes the assessment regarding the depth of the ulcer bleeding ulcer bleeds on touch then it is a malignant ulcer relation with the deeper structure ulcer is to ma made to move over the deeper structure to know whether it is fixed to any of these structures gummatus ulcer over subcutaneous tissue or bone is fixed malignant ulcer is fixed to the deeper structures by infiltration so depending upon the relation to the deeper structures whether it is fixed or it is movable we need to classify these ulcers next coming to the treatment of ulcer uh, mostly 2% viscous lignocaine uh, is given which can be swish and spit out 5 ml 4 to 5 times per day or liquid diphenhydramine can be given or combination therapy can be given by giving a combination of viscous ligno uh, lignocaine diphenhydramine and a covering agent 0.1% dicyclo di diclonine hydrochloride may be given benzodiazepine systemic analgesia and supportive care includes hydration ice chips a bland a soft bland diet and antipyretics such as ibuprofen as needed so this uh, we come to the end of the examination of an ulcer next we are going to study about the examination of tmj and lymph nodes both of which are very important from a clinical point of view so starting with the temporomandibular joint a temporomandibular joint are the joints which connect the jaw bone to the skull as we are aware uh, the temporomandibular joint uh, joint it connects the uh, jaw bones to the skull 
starting with the examination of the TMJ, it includes the history, the clinical examination and the imaging of the joint. So, uh, diagnosis of TMJ disorders require an understanding and examination of the articulatory system. Starting with the history of the patient, a detailed patient history is taken. Questions that need to be asked are history of limited or painful jaw opening, discomfort of the joint during closure, locked or restricted movement of the jaw, sounds like kicking or clicking or popping during the movements, soreness of facial and neck muscles, history of trauma to the head and neck region, and pain around the ear, temples or cheeks. So these are the leading questions which needs to be asked to the patient, uh, whether if he comes with the chief complaint of pain in the TMJ area. Clinical examination, we inspect the range of motion, palpation, load testing of each joint in auscultation, we check the sounds using a stethoscope and then we continue with the periodontal and dental examination. In inspection, we measure uh, the active range of motion which in males is greater than 40 mm and in females it is greater than 35 mm. Whereas the passive range of motion, in active range of motion is the highest amount of uh, um, opening the patient can do. Whereas a passive range of motion, it does not hurt. Active range of motion can hurt when the patient opens his mouth. So passive range of motion, males less than 37 and females less than 32 mm. Lateral extrusions 9 mm and protrusion of the mandible 7 mm. So these are the normal values uh, of the range of motion. The clinical significance, the active range of motion is painful whereas the pa passive range of mo motion there is no muscle involvement. Limitation of vertical movement, if there is pain then there is muscle involvement. If there is obstruction to the movement then there is disc displacement. Deviation. So, uh, movement is normal till just before the maximum range when a lateral deviation occurs. So, we can come to the uh, diagnosis as anterior disc displacement without reduction. So, uh, it is normal only before the maximum range a lateral deviation occurs. So, in this case it is disc displacement without reduction. Joint can move as far as possible but at different rates. So, it is disc displacement with reduction. Okay, so there are two types, this displacement without and with reduction. So this is also called as transient deviation. Coming to the palpation, on palpation of the TMJ, so pressure applied is 2 LBS per inch square. Two types of palpation are noted, intraauricular and extraauricular palpation. Intraauricular palpation, as you can see in the figure, can be done by placing the little finger inside the external auditory meatus. During mandibular movement, the posterior pole of the condylar head can be palpated with the pulp of the little finger. Extraauricular palpation can be done by placing the index finger in the preauricular region about 1.5 cm medial to the tragus of the ear. The clinical significance of these uh, inflammation in joint structures or superficial muscles, pain on firm palpation with the mouth closed. So if there is pain on firm palpation, we can say that there is inflammation of muscles. If there is pain on palpation while opening, we can say that there is disc involvement, that is the retrodiscal tissues are involved. Uh, if there is a taut band of muscle fibers, so there is referred pain to the teeth or other orofacial regions, then we can say it's case of myalgia. Adhesion, arthrosis and possible contracture gives a hard feeling on palpation. So what is load testing of the joint? Load testing is mainly a means to palpate the head of the condyle, the surface of the glenoid fossa and the tissue interposed between them except in case of bone to bone contact. So as you can see in the figure using your thumb and other three fingers you can do the loading test uh, for the examination of the TMJ. So bimanual mandibular manipulation, slight force is applied by the fingers, uh, so increasing force to the load, we need to test the joint, so we increase the force, so if there is discomfort, so muscle incoordination can be noted and anterior disc displacement can be noted if there is discomfort on the loading test. Coming to the auscultation, joint sounds are noted by using a stethoscope or a Doppler instrument. What is a click? A click is a distinct sound of brief duration. It suggests a disc disorder. Multiple clicking suggests a disc perforation. So reciprocal clicking. Clicking while opening and closing as you can see in the figure. The condyle translates forward so there is a click sound. Or condyle may translate backward then there is a reciprocal clicking. That is clicking while opening and closing.
popping sound is loud sound on opening without the stethoscope when we define what is a popping sound it is a loud sound on opening without the use of stethoscope a crepitus is multiple gravel like sound like grating fine crepitus is weak grating sound uh, mild bone to bone contact is noted coarse crepitus is a strong grating sound gross bone to bone contact is seen uh, it suggests degenerative joint disease this popping sound or this crepitus it suggests a degenerative joint disease so at last we see the periodontal and dental examination of the patient we see for the occlusal discrepancies which may lead to tmj abnormalities attachment loss tooth mobility and parafunctional habits like bruxism or clenching coming to the last part that is the lymph nodes and of head and neck region so here in the figure you can see the different types of lymph nodes like parotid submandibular sublingual submental so they are classified as two horizontal and two vertical chain of lymph nodes so we also have the mastoid retropharyngeal occipital superior jugular middle jugular spinal accessory so these are all the different types of lymph nodes lymph nodes in the head and neck are arranged into two horizontal rings and two vertical chains on either side of the neck here we can see the horizontal group includes the submental the submandibular parotid so these are all the horizontal group the other group uh, other is a vertical group of lymph nodes which includes the jugulodigastric the infrahyoid the prelaryngeal so this is one classification the other classification is lymph node supplying superficial area of head and neck and lymph node supplying deep areas of head and neck so based on the lymphatic drainage we have head uh, uh, lymph nodes of the superficial head and neck region and lymph nodes of the deep structures of head and neck region in superficial we further classify it as regional lymph nodes and deep uh, cervical nodes uh, in deep nodes also we further classify it as regional and deep cervical nodes so first we are going to study about the lymphatic drainage of the superficial structures of head and neck so in regional lymph nodes we have the occipital the retroauricular the parotid buccal submandibular submental and anterior cervical nodes starting with the occipital nodes as you can see in the figure this is uh, the occipital node so at the apex of the posterior triangle it is located superficial to the trapezius uh, it sup it supplies to the back of the scalp and the descending is to the deep cervical lymph nodes okay next we come to the retroauricular lymph nodes which are superficial to the sternocleidomastoid and mastoid process and deep to the auricularis posterior muscle so they supply to the strip of the scalp above auricle and posterior external auditory meatus so this is the supply of the retroauricular nodes the parotid nodes which further include the superficial parotid and deep parotid superficial parotid strip of the scalp above the parotid gland and lateral wall of the auricle anterior external auditory meatus and lateral part of the eyelid so this is the supply of the parotid lymph nodes Uh, the descending it includes the middle ear and the deep cervical lymph nodes coming to the buccal lymph nodes we have uh, they are located on the surface of the buccinator muscle in relation to the facial vein their supply is to the lower eyelid and part of cheek and the buccinator muscle the descending is to the submandibular lymph node coming to the submandibular lymph node which are of great importance so the submandibular lymph node we can uh, we are further going to see the examination of these lymph nodes the supply is to the front of the scalp nose and adjacent cheek frontal maxillary and ethmoidal sinuses lips except the central part of the lower lip and anterior two third of the tum tongue except the tip the floor of the mouth vestibule and gums so this is the supply of the submandibular lymph node the ascending submental uh, lymph nodes uh, they supply to the tip of the tongue floor of the mouth beneath the tip of the tongue the central part of the lower lip and the skin over the chin they descend into the submandibular lymph nodes and the deep cervical lymph nodes that is called as the jugulo omohyoid lymph nodes the anterior superficial cervical nodes they supply the skin over the angle of jaw and over the apex of the parotid gland and ear lobule Here we finish the lymphatic drainage of the superficial structures coming to the lymphatic drainage of the deeper structures of the head and neck region we have the regional and the deep cervical nodes in regional we are further going to study the retropharyngeal the paratracheal infrahyoid prelaryngeal pretracheal and the lingual lymph nodes so retropharyngeal it lies as the term suggests it lies behind the pharynx 
and in front of the vertebral column uh, the ascending supplies to the pharynx the auditory tube the soft palate and posterior part of the hard palate and the nose so here you can see the position of the retropharyngeal lymph nodes coming to the paratracheal they are supply to the they are located close to the trachea so paratracheal is the term used they supply to the neighboring structures and the thyroid gland and the descending is to the deep cervical lymph nodes the infrahyoid prelaryngeal and pretracheal they supply to the anterior cervical lymph nodes deep cervical lymph nodes first is the jugular digastric node so it is located posterior uh, posterior belly of digastric between the angle of mandible and the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid it supplies the tongue the tonsil and its descending is to the lower deep cervical lymph nodes the jugulohomoid lymph nodes they are located between the angle between the internal jugular vein and the superior belly of homoid they supply the tongue the superficial and super, uh, superior deep cervical nodes and the descending into the jugular coming to the examination of lymph node which is of great importance so we first inspect the lymph node that is we see the number position and size we see the skin over the lymph node whether it is acute uh, so if it is red inflamed edema so it is acute lymphadenitis chronic lymphadenitis no change tuberculosis and cold abscess the skin is cold and the lymphosarcoma tense shining with dilated subcutaneous veins is noted normally the lymph nodes are not palpable if they are palpable then there is a underlying pathological reason for it the palpation number size tenderness the temperature the margins consistency fixation to the underlying tissue is noted in acute infection they are large soft painful and mobile in chronic infection they are large firm less tender and mobile in lymphoma we can note that the lymph nodes are rubbery hard matted painless and multiple in cancer uh, that is in the metastatic cancer or in metastasis they are stony hard and they are fixed to the underlying tissue syphilis they are firm discrete and shorty tuberculosis stage 1 we will see lymph node enlarged without matting in stage 2 we will see lymph node enlarged with matting and in stage 3 we can note it as cold abscess so here in the figure uh, pre auricular tonsillar submental submandibular anterior cervical posterior cervical and supra clavicular lymph nodes have been marked so here is the uh, examination of the pre auricular lymph nodes we examine by using the index finger and the uh, uh, in, we examine by using the middle finger and the third finger uh, in the pre auricular area similarly post auricular lymph nodes are examined by placing the fingers in the posterior uh, side of the ear then coming to the examination of the occipital lymph nodes at the neck region some mental lymph nodes are examined as shown in the figure by using the thumb and the middle finger and the ring finger in such a way some mandibular lymph nodes are examined by standing behind the patient by using the uh, both the hands and asking the patient to flex the neck uh, on the side in which the swelling is present superficial cervical lymph nodes they are uh, palpated in this way and the posterior superficial lymph nodes are palpated in this way thank you